welcome back to Gay Fat Friend and Friends, the podcast. The podcast for lucky ones. It's episode eight. Can you believe it? We've been doing this for two months. You guys, I'm pretty proud of myself, actually. Um, Two months is a long time to do anything. And I was like, if I can just get three or four episodes out the door, I'll be great and I'll feel accomplished. And now we're on episode eight. How cool is that? Also, eight is my lucky number. Eight plays a big part in my life. Um, I was born in August. I was born in 1980. It's the most beautiful number, if you think about it. Um, It also means infinity. Like, seriously, it's such a special number. I actually have it tattooed on my body, (laughs) which is kind of a funny story. I went in college, so maybe the year 2000. In the year 2000. Um... In 2000, I was working at a bar. No, no, this had to have been 2001, 2002. Anyway, you don't know. You weren't there. I could lie. Um, But yeah, it was like around 2001, 2002, because I was working at a bar called, oh, what was it called? Bel Air. I was working at Bel Air, which was predominantly an outdoor bar. It had a giant deck and there were so many delicious deck puns. You know, it's not the size of your deck. It's how you use it. Things like that. And um, I was working at Bel Air and the owner's wife, she was really great. I cannot remember her name to save my life, but she was super great. We were really great friends at the time. And she was like, I'm going to get a tattoo. Do you want to come with me? And I was like, sure, great. And so I go sit with her while she gets her tattoo. And then she was like, do you want anything? I'm buying. And I was like, what? And she was like, if you want to get a little tattoo, the shop minimum is only 30 bucks. I'll totally pay for it. And I was like, uh, 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 I'm not prepared. So... I settled on my lucky number, which is eight, and I've always wanted a tattoo on the inside of my ankle. Like when I was in high school and stuff, I would always draw little doodles on my ankle right there, right above like, you know, kind of my sock line. And uh, so I was like, you know what? I will get the number eight on my ankle because I've always wanted a tattoo there. And so he, you know, draws it out in a, a delicious font. And he was like, you can get a good five or six more numbers if you want. I mean, the shop minimum is 30 bucks, so you're going to have to pay that no matter what. Do you want to get more numbers? And I was like, I don't want my phone number. <laughs> I don't need my social on my ankle. No, I'm good with just the eight. And he tattooed it really fast, and, and it was done. And, and yeah, that was like my second tattoo ever, and I love it. I do need to get her t- uh, touched up because she's a, she has bled. Tattoos on your feet, especially like where your socks hit. They bleed. And, you know, at this point, 25 years old. So, or uh, approaching 25 years old. So, yeah, I need to get that tattoo touched up. But all that to say, welcome to episode eight. We made it. And I think for episode eight, this is our first true no housekeeping segment. Housekeeping, not today. No housekeeping. Nothing to correct. Nothing to go back on. Nothing to figure out. I have nothing to talk about from last episode. And you know, honestly, that's a treat. That means I'm doing things right. And I'm proud of myself for that. Um, I am about to start a weight loss journey because, you know, it's time. It's, I, I am 43 and a half. I am the heaviest I've ever been in my life. I don't have a problem with being a fat person in society. And I don't think that being fat is a bad thing, but I need to lose weight because I'm uncomfortable and I'm getting older and I'm starting to like feel it. Like I've told you guys before, I'm always out of breath. My asthma is back with a vengeance living here in Seattle. And I just, being this size is hard to navigate on a daily basis. Plus I miss my old clothes. I have some really cute 50 pounds ago clothes. You know what I'm saying? And I wanna get back into those. So I'm about to start a weight loss journey this week. And I'm a little nervous because I've started 1 million weight loss journeys. Like there was a time. So like I said, I'm currently the heaviest I've ever been. Uh, Back when I was 28, the first time I ever like did a true hardcore adult diet, I lost 75 pounds and I kept it off for like five or six years. Like I was a lot smaller. And then, you know, comfortable relationship, love living my life. It slowly started to come back because... I would say dating and being single was a pretty big pressure on my weight loss journey at the time. And so once I was comfortable with Rob and comfortable with my life and knew how I wanted to live and how I wanted to be, I didn't really need to lose weight. Or I should say, I didn't really need to like hike and exercise. 
as much as I did before because you know, I got a man and he literally does not care what I look like. Like he thinks I'm cute and he thinks I'm handsome and he loves me. Like he does not care what size I am ever. And he and he's never cared and he's never said anything about it, which is honestly another reason why he's my soulmate. But uh, what was I saying? Who knows? Lost it. Anyway, I need to lose weight because I'm uncomfortable and I want to get back to, uh, you know, my smaller clothes. Oh, that's what I was saying. I've started one million diets. I, I've dieted probably every year since 2012, maybe 2013. Like, like I said, I started the diet when I was 28 in 2008, lost 75 pounds and kept it off for a long time and kind of regularly exercised and just ate a, a little more consciously. And then when I started to gain the weight back and noticed it and I was like, uh Oh, I better, try to get back down to my smallest size was in like 2013, maybe 2014. And so, and you know, living in LA, you're kind of always reminded that you need to lose weight. Plus it's, it's the great kind of climate that you can work out outdoors and, and enjoy the weather at all times. Like my biggest way to lose weight is hiking and um, running Canyon is where I lost almost all the weight I've ever lost. And you can do that in LA because the weather is nice and you can hike outdoors every day. I think another reason I've gained so much weight up here in Seattle is because I'm literally stuck in the house for months on end because you can't hike outside. So I do have an exercise bike. It's whatever. I don't need to go into depth. But like any fat person, I have started a diet and, and been dieting two, three times a year, every year for over a decade. And so I every single time I start a diet and I start working out, I always fear the end because there will come a time when I stop working out. I mean, last year I did 90 days straight hardcore. I did not, or what I consider hardcore for myself. And I did not lose the kind of weight I was hoping to lose. And I still really haven't figured out why that happened. I mean, I did everything I've ever done in the past to lose weight and I plateaued after losing 25 pounds and I just stopped. I mean, there was the first 30 days I lost, I lost like 20 pounds. The second 30 days I lost five pounds. And then the third 30 days I lost zero and I didn't change anything. I kept working out the same. I kept eating healthily the same. And it was, it was really frustrating. And so every time I start a diet, I kind of think of how it's going to end or how it's going to go and how I'm going to get bored with it or stressed out about it or stuff like that. So I am starting a, <laughs> I am starting a weight loss journey this week and I don't know. It's kind of like an abusive relationship. Every time I'm like, this time is going to be different, but will it? I know that everybody else is on Ozempic and Wagovi and stuff like that right now. Monjero. I tried to get a prescription for it. My insurance last year did not cover it. They said it was only for diabetic people. I talked to my new doctor about it this year and he said it's only for diabetic people. So I, I just feel like I'm never going to get that shot. And that sucks unless I want to pay out of pocket. And that's the other thing. I have a ton of friends that are paying $1,300 a month for this shot. I'm like, I can't afford that. I might as well get gastric bypass at that point. But yeah, so I'm starting a weight loss journey this week. How many times have I said weight loss journey? Uh, and, but I did just see a really great film by my friend online. We've never met in real life. I believe they call us mutuals. I think that's what mutuals are. If you've, if you're friends on the internet, but you've never met in real life. Um, but one of my mutuals has a documentary out. Um, her name is Your Fat Friend, and that's her like handle on Twitter and Instagram and everything. And that's the name of the documentary, Your Fat Friend. And it's just about her journey as being a fat activist and a fat voice um, in the modern space. And she, she's very well known. Um, she has a great podcast called Maintenance Phase. It's one of my favorite podcasts. It's so good where they just debunk diet culture and fitness culture and food culture, every like health food culture, I should say. It's just such a great, well-researched, well-put-together podcast. I highly recommend it if you're into that kind of thing. It's called Maintenance Phase. It's everywhere. It's huge. Like, check it out. And uh, she did a documentary. It's called Your Fat Friend. I got to see it at a screening here in Seattle last week. And it was just, it was so good. And it really kind of reinforced all my thoughts about being fat and dieting and stuff like that, but also going into a new weight loss journey. And yeah. Uh, I'm excited about this one. We'll see how it goes. I obviously will keep you posted. If you're watching this on YouTube, you'll visually see it every week if I start shrinking. And um, first and foremost, right out of the gate, I just want to say that 
your body is valid at any size. Don't let anyone ever make you feel different. And also don't let health food culture, like I talked about last week, there's no good food and there's no bad food. Food has no morals. So I am going to be using food as a means to lose weight on my body and try to make myself smaller, but that's it. I'm not gonna be a better person because I lost weight. If I don't lose weight, I'm not a failure. It's not a battle, it's not a fight. No one's losing in this situation. I just wanna put that out there that everybody's journey is different and just know that no matter what you do with your body, what size it is, you're valid, beautiful, and loved. The other thing I wanted to talk about, totally jumping subjects, turning a corner. Um, if you watch this podcast on YouTube, if you're watching at home, then you'll see that there is art and there are crochet projects behind me. And I get a lot of questions to talk about them. So I figured now is as good a time as any. So again, if you are watching this, you will understand this. Listening, you might not get it, but I'll try to be as descriptive as possible. So behind me, there are two framed, I guess you could say, artworks. This one is of a Siamese cat. Her name is Pookie. My grandma did this. It's needlepoint. It's a needlepoint from the 60s of a Siamese cat that I have seen in my life for years. My grandma always had it. It's like a big, it was a big part of her house when I was growing up and I always loved it. And so that's something I inherited um, and had framed and just every time I look at it, my grandma is the one who got me into cooking. She got me into crafting, especially like fiber art and stuff like that. Like I get all, she taught me how to knit and crochet and I get all of my craftiness from her. So I love having that piece on the wall because it's just so quintessentially Grandma K and I love it so much. And then this painting <laughs> of a very typical, beautiful gay man, uh, abstract, is a watercolor. Uh, his privates are covered by a post-it note with a smiley face on it. And he, it's not like there's a penis under there, you guys. It is just like a artistic representation of a bulge. And I covered it just because I put this on YouTube and I don't want to get like in trouble for anything. But I don't really have to. It's not obscene. It, it, he's not, he is nude, but it, it's not a penis. I don't know. I can't describe it. But I covered it with a post-it. And the story behind this is, first of all, I love it. It's totally like artistically what I like. But it was a housewarming gift from my dear, dear friend, John, who unfortunately passed away a few years after he gave it to me. But he gave it to me when I moved into a house with my friends in LA and it had a pool and we had a pool, like an inaugural pool party, housewarming kind of thing. And he brought it over. And it was just something that he found at like a Goodwill or a thrift shop. And he was like, you know, every gay man needs a, a naked man picture in his house. So this one's for you. And he didn't really take it seriously. I didn't really take it seriously. And then, like I said, he passed away not too long after that. And so I kind of treasure it because he kind of, that was his body. He kind of looks like that. So I, every day I look at it and then I think of John and um, yeah, I just love it so much. And like he said, every gay man does need a naked painting of a man in their home. Um, how else are people going to know you're gay, you know? And that painting has traveled, has moved with me, obviously, every house I've had since, and it's always proudly displayed. I feel bad it did come, like, framed with glass, and one of our moves, it shattered, and it kind of cut the bottom corner, the broken glass did. And it made me so mad, and I was going to have it reframed, and when I took it to a place, they were like, actually, the type of frame it's built in, it's like an old aluminum frame, it's kind of, like, permanently in that frame, and it would be so hard to get out, so... I think it kind of adds to the story and the lore of that painting anyway. So that's my naked man painting that's behind me in every shot. And then all of my crochet back here are just some blankets. It's the first uh, kind of table runner that I ever did. Like, I don't, it's like a long blanket you put on the end of your bed, but it serves no purpose other than to look at. But yeah, that's made out of flowers. And then underneath that is my first king size Afghan. My first Afghan that I ever made all by myself. It took me, I don't know three or four months last year. But yeah, and then I have my big giant Pendleton blanket that I got from Costco, which I like to call my sick blanket because it is huge, it is fluffy, and it is warm to the max. I mean, even on the coldest day, if you are underneath this Pendleton blanket, you are going to sweat your balls off in about four minutes. So whenever I have like 
the flu or a fever or anything, that's my like sick blanket, you know, because that'll really sweat it out of you. Also, if you're like super hungover or you just need a detox, get you one of these giant fluffy Pendleton blankets because you could sweat out a lot of regrets underneath that baby. Okay. Um, all right. Let's take a little break and we'll be right back. And we're back. Uh, you guys, it is so hard to talk to yourself for 30 minutes and make it like conversational. <laughs> this is, it's really hard. To, and it's also like hard to think of things to talk about. But my friend Jim reminded me of a funny story that I used to tell in my stand up. And I haven't told it in a long time, so hopefully I get it all correct. But like I said in another episode, I auditioned for every commercial you had ever seen ever on TV and I didn't book any of them. That's why you don't recognize me, right? And one of the most memorable auditions I ever had was for Jack in the Box. And the coolest thing about the commercial was that you were going to get to wear the Jack in the Box head, which that was the most exciting thing to me. I didn't care what was happening in the commercial at all. But the fact that you were you were going to get to wear the Jack head and be in the commercial, because like, you know, you want people to see your face when you're acting. Um, and I, I think they honestly pay you different if they can't see your face. But just the fact that you would get to wear the Jack head, I was on board. The commercial was that like Jack's crazy brother was in town or something. So you were going to be Jack's brother, but it was a Jack head. So I get the call for this audition and I, I show up to the studio and for the audition, they're just putting a trash can on people's heads, like a mesh Ikea trash can. So you can still, still see through it, but like it wasn't the Jack head. And you know, that was a little disappointing. But I do the audition with a literal trash can on my head and then a couple days go by and then I get a call back that I get to go in and actually try on the jack head and audition for the director of the commercial. And it doesn't matter what the project is. When you get a call back, when you're an actor, it is like winning the lottery. I know that it's not the job, but there's just this like reinforcement of choices when you get a call back for a commercial and it just feels so fucking good. And so not only did I get a call back, but I also was going to get to wear the jack head. Like, it's so exciting. So I get to the call back and they're like running way behind. And I think I was supposed to be seen at like 3 p.m. And it, it got to be like 530. And we're all just like sitting there waiting to be seen. I think I was the last or second to last person they were going to see. It felt like they just called back everybody that they had seen in the original audition. But I finally get called in to read for the director and I go in and the director starts talking to me and I was like, wait a minute, that sounds like Jack. Turns out the director and kind of inventor and writer of every Jack in the Box commercial has been the same guy and he does Jack's voice. So he writes them. He does the voice and he directs them. And he's, you know, just like an older white guy. And he's in the room with the heads. And like you see when you walk in on a stand, like on a table, are the Jack heads from the commercials. And you're going to get to try them on. And then Jack is talking to you about the script and giving you direction. It was a very surreal, crazy moment. So I had sat in the lobby all day. I finally get called in. Jack himself is there. And I go, I set up, I slate, they bring the head over and they stand behind me and almost like crowning a king in Game of Thrones or something. They lower it on my head from behind and it gets to my head and then boof, it just stops like right above my ears. And it is just the tightest, hardest thing. And I, I was like, oh God, my head is too big because... You know, I'm a giant and I struggle with being a giant and I have a gigantic head. And so they're lowering this jack head, which I was so excited to try on. I've been waiting so long and it was like building up in my head for so long. And I go to put the jack head on my head and boom, it just stops. And internally, I'm screaming. I was like, no, I've been waiting so long for this moment and I'm too big. And they, they kind of like twisted it and shook it a little bit. And it was just not budging. Like it was not going to go over my head. And so uh, the director, who was really nice, very sweet man, he was like, oh, well, we have another one. We have a backup head. Let's let's put that head on. And a cool thing about these heads is like they are high tech. There's like at the time, I mean, it's probably way different now. There was an iPad inside. There were little cameras on it. Like there's vent holes. Like th this head is high tech, right? It was like the original Apple Vision Pro. So they... 
go to get this like backup head and they go and they like start to bring it down over my head and boom, it just stops again. The hole is the same size. And I'm just internally dying and screaming and melting. I'm so sad. I'm like freaking out. And they're like, well, the commercial is wearing the head. And if the head doesn't fit now, it's not going to fit then. So I guess we're just going to have to pass. And I was like, I totally get it, you guys. Uh, thanks for seeing me. I hope you guys have a great day. And like, I leave the room and I'm walking through the lobby. And as soon as I get out of the building, walking to my car, I just start scream crying. And literally I was like, I'm too big for everything. I hate this. And bawling, having a full public meltdown, just walking to my car, a grown ass man, just crying, screaming, walking to my car. Then I get to my car and I look over and there's like five or six construction guys just sitting there like having a end of the shift like meal, beer. I don't know. They were all just like sitting on this like loading dock next to where I parked. And they fully were all just looking at me while I'm scream crying. I feel like if phones, especially if like TikTok or Instagram had video back then, they would have recorded me and it probably would have gone viral because I was having a full on screaming meltdown getting into my car. And I was like, just great. And I, of course, I did that thing where, like, I'm screaming and walking and crying, and I get in my car, and then I scream even louder. So I get in my car, and I'm just like, I hate being big! Ah! You know, spinning and crying everywhere. And, of course, I dwelled on it for, like, a day or two, and then I got over it. Because what are you going to do? You know, I, I, nothing I do, I mean, there's not even a plastic surgery that exists to make my skull smaller. So dwelling on it would have served no purpose except to like kill heart cells and make me sad forever. So I had a good cry <laughs> about the jack head not fitting my giant melon. And then I got over it. And um, yeah, every time I eat a Jack in the Box, I think about that. And every time I see a Jack in the Box commercial, I think about how the Jack voice is also the director of every commercial. It's wild. All right. And on that note, I think it's a perfect time to do our final segment, which is what's your order? What's your order? How funny would it be if we got Jack in the Box today? Because we haven't gotten Jack in the Box yet, right? I know it's in here. As always, I'm joined by my trusty blue rip and dip box filled with America's favorite fast food restaurants. And if you're not familiar with this segment, every week... I pick out a name of a fast food restaurant and tell you what my order is. And then I ask you what your order is. And it's a delight. I don't think we've done Jack in the Box yet. And there's not that many left in here. So hopefully we get it. How funny would that be? Anyway, today's What Your Order restaurant is Starbucks. All right, not Jack in the Box. That would have been funny, but Starbucks. All right, well, some people may or may not consider Starbucks a fast food restaurant, but it 100% is. Um, and especially with mobile ordering, it's one of my favorite fast food restaurants. Starbucks makes me feel fancy. I love drinking out of a, a, just a good old venti paper Starbucks cup. And it's so funny, my favorite thing to do is to keep those cups for like two or three days, rinse them out, and use them every morning with my own personal coffee because there's just something about drinking out of a paper Starbucks cup with that lid, I just it's like I gotta drink wine out of a wine glass and I gotta drink Starbucks or I gotta drink coffee out of a Starbucks cup. It just feels right. All right, so my Starbucks order is, and it's been this way for so long. I get a venti Americano. Oh, a lot of Starbucks have taken away the milk bar, like they all do the milk behind and sugars, they all do it behind the counter now, I think because of COVID and stuff. So I get a venti Americano with half and half, and I always say like a heavy splash, a heavy pour of half and half because I like a creamy coffee, and three Splendas. That is my beverage from Starbucks, hot. I only, only really only get hot coffee from Starbucks. I will occasionally get a nitro cold brew sometimes if I need to. Like after the dentist last month, I had a fluoride treatment, which was like wax they paint on your teeth. And she was like, you can't eat anything hot for two hours. So I had to get an iced coffee after that because I couldn't have hot coffee. But 99% of the time, almost every single day of my life, I drink hot coffee, rain or shine, heat wave or cold snap. It doesn't matter. I love hot coffee. So yeah, a venti Americano, Lots of half and half and three Splenda. And then I always get the sausage, egg, and cheese English muffin sandwich. It is truly delicious. 
it's I feel like they sell out of it every day. It's the one that's like always sold out if you go too late in the day. So you got to get there early to get the sausage breakfast sandwich. But ooh, it is delicious. Sausage breakfast sandwich and a venti americano with the occasional cold brew. But Starbucks is really great. And again, I don't want to like keep harping on this, but Starbucks is really great if you are dieting and on a weight loss journey. <laughs> a new drinking game. Drink every time I say weight loss journey or jackhead. Anyway, if you're on a weight loss journey, uh, Starbucks is a great place to help with that because you can get like really healthy snacks of like fruit and cheese and nuts and they're totally like unprocessed plain stuff. And so when I am dieting and, and working on my fitness, I like to get the, the fruit and cheese little, you know, almost like a bento box of snacks. You can also get just like bags of almonds, bananas, peanut butter pouches, like really good protein sources. They always have like a hard boiled egg available. Starbucks is really great if you're working on your fitness. I highly recommend. So, and Starbucks will all, especially in the morning, oh, like a, like a 7 a.m. kind of morning. Like if you have to get up, just putting that mobile order in and hopping down to the Starbucks to get your breakfast. It's such a treat. Also, if you're not mobile ordering at Starbucks, what are you doing? Why are you ordering, especially like in the drive through but like even in store, if you're ordering at a counter, what happened? What's wrong? Did you lose your phone? Why are you not mobile ordering? You guys, it is the simplest, easiest, fastest way to order food. It is such a treat. Uh, I don't really do it everywhere because at places like McDonald's, they're trying to get you to the you. They're trying to get you to use that app for I feel like some kind of political reason, and I don't really know why. So we don't use the McDonald's app for mobile ordering that much. Plus, like, I feel like we modify food. We ask for extra sauces. Like, I like to order McDonald's myself, you know, face to face. But with Starbucks, it's most you're mostly getting drinks, right? Maybe occasionally food, but you're mostly getting drinks from Starbucks. Just mobile order, honey. And you get points. And like once or twice a month, you get a free drink. It's the best. Seriously, I am always so confused when I see people going into a Starbucks and just like ordering at the counter for so long. I'm like, you could have saved yourself and the Starbucks workers so much time if you had just done this on your phone. Seriously, if you're not mobile ordering at Starbucks, now is the time, okay? You've lost a lot of time, but you can totally make up for it. There's still time, okay? No, no day like today. Start mobile ordering. And please, what's your Starbucks order? Because that's another thing. I don't think people are really getting several different drinks throughout the week. I feel like most people get one beverage at Starbucks. Like I said, maybe two. But beyond that, I don't think people are just switching it up every single day. So let me know what you get from Starbucks. Or, you know, if you're a Dunkin' gal, maybe you're a Pete's uh, coffee and tea leaf person. Uh, we don't have those things up here in Seattle. So Starbucks is pretty much all I got when it comes to fast food coffee. All right, and that's it. Kind of a short one today. Uh, did, like I said, talking to yourself for 30 minutes and making it conversational is hard. And I know that the podcast is called Gay Fat Friend and Friends. I promise I will have friends on soon. I'm still trying to figure it out. It's, it's tricky. It's hard. And I'm afraid it's going to add a lot of extra work. So I will probably have Rob, my teeny tiny husband, as my very first guest. And we will probably do that soon so I can just do it in-house with two microphones and not have to worry about Zoom or anything over the internet of recording another person's half of the story. So, but yeah, thanks for listening to the podcast. I hope you guys are having a great day wherever you are. You seriously make this so much fun and I love hearing from you all the time. Let me know what you get at Starbucks and uh, yeah, I'll see you next week. All right, goodbye. <laughs>